Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video we will be discussing eukaryotes, helminths, fungi, algae, lichens, and viruses. This is the fifth of ten lessons as part of my Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and the course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include summarizing characteristics and lifestyles of unicellular eukaryotic parasites, describing and classifying and giving examples of these unicellular eukaryotes, comparing and giving examples of parasitic helminths, nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes, describing characteristics of fungi, algae, and lichens, including their reproduction, classification, toxicity, and in the case of lichens, their symbiosis, identifying the primary causes of infection due to yeast and mold, describing characteristics of viruses, including their pathogenicity, life cycle, host cell interactions, and their cultivation. And finally, we will just touch on the primary characteristics of viroids and prions. Okay, so section 5.1 is talking about unicellular eukaryotic parasites. Figure 5.1 is giving an example here of malaria. Malaria is a unicellular eukaryote that is transmitted via vector transmission. The vector is mosquitoes. So this is sporozoite life stage, trophozoite, and cyzont in blood smears. And then on the right, this is a mosquito net that people that live in high cases of malaria, they use mosquito nets to help protect them. So essentially what we've got here is malaria that is infecting blood cells here in the middle. This is late into the life cycle. Uh, protists, protists are kind of a catch-all name for things that are not prokaryotic, they're not archaea. They're a polyphyletic group and they are all consists of eukaryotes. So it's a little bit confusing because when you see something named pro, you want to say prokaryote, but actually protists are all eukaryotes. They can be unicellular or multicellular, and they're very different. They vary widely in food supply, morphology, locomotion, reproduction. Some structures that protists are, that commonly have are things like vacuoles and cilia, flagella, pellicles, and pseudopods. But not all of them have those kinds of things, of course, and some of them lack some organelles that you would expect eukaryotes to have, including mitochondria. So, yeah, this is a very, very diverse group, the protists. And, in fact, taxonomy is changing all the time. Whenever new techniques for identifying these things become available, such as, you know, molecular uh, genetics. But we're going to talk, we're going to focus mostly on protists that are pathogenic, or they're parasitic. Um, this here is an example of a se sexual and asexual life cycle. So yeah, their reproduction strategy can change depending on whether they have a host, what environment they're living in, if they have certain levels of oxygen. These are oocysts and they're shed in feces, which are then ingested by a new host. So again, this is an example of fecal oral transmission. These are some of the structures that are present in protists. In um, paramecium, you have this contractile vacuole. You also have cilia, right? And uh, your amoebas have pseudopods. Pseudopods means false foot, right? And then your euglena have this uh, flagella. It's a monotrichous flagella arrangement. This is a phylogenetic tree showing the proposed or current classification of the domain of Eukarya, um, in other words, the protists. As of now, it is divided into six different groups, and within each of the six groups, there are multiple kingdoms. So this is uh, comprising a very, very large portion of the phylogenetic tree of life. Um, the dotted lines are indicating suggested, it says suggested evolutionary relationships that are currently under debate. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of debate 
still going on. The problem is, is a lot of these things, when you're defining species of microorganisms, it, it can be kind of difficult because a lot of them are so genetically similar, yet they are, they're definitely different as far as their habitats, what they eat, their structures. So they can phenotypically look quite different and behave quite different. And yet genotypically, they're really, really similar, like 99% similarity in their nucleic acids. So yeah, these things are, are still being debated by scientists. Uh, so 5.2, this is parasitic helminths. These are parasites, and they are actually large enough to see with the naked eye. But the reason that they're included in the study of microbiology is because their eggs and their, lar their larvae are microscopic. And not only that, but their eggs and their larvae are usually what is used to identify them to genus or species. Your two major groups of helminths are the roundworms and the flatworms. The roundworms are nematodes and then the flatworms are platyhelminths. Um, nematodes are common intestinal parasites that are transmitted through undercooked foods, um, and you also can pick them up in the environment, but generally it's through food. Platyhelminths, these are your tapeworms and flukes, and those are usually uh, specifically transmitted through undercooked meat. This is a nematode uh, enterobios vermicularis, also known as pinworm. That's figure 519. Uh, figure 520, this is showing a lot of different representations of uh, your cloudy helmets. You've got class turbularia, class monogenia, class trematoda, and class cestoda. These were the ones we saw um, this in chapter one. Those were the ones that have to be wound, like they have to pull them out and wind them around a matchstick or toothpick in order to get them to come out. So they're really gross. Um, this here, this is a bedward, Bedford's flatworm, and it's about 10 centimeters long. Um, this is commonly called a gill fluke over here. And then Trumato, this is the common liver fluke, and this is a big, huge tapeworm. Okay, so 5.3 fungi. Again, fungi are very diverse eukaryotic organisms, and they have uh, chitin cell walls, which provide structural support. Fungi can, again, they can be unicellular or multicellular. The unicellular fungi are your yeast, and multicellular ones, they can be very, very large uh, and really resemble plants, or they can be microscopic in the form of spores, reproductive spores. Generally, different types of fungi are distinguished using their reproduction, what type of reproduction that they undergo. Um, some of your medically important fungi are the zygomycota, the ascomycota, the basidiomycota, and all three of those um, produce deadly toxins. And then there's also the microsporidia. Ergosteroids and fungal membranes are usually the targets for antifungal medications. But the problem with these antifungal medications is that there's, the cells are really similar. The cells in fungi, their structure anyway, can be really similar to human cells. So some of the antifungal medications can actually destroy human cells, which of course is toxic. So there's some difficulty there. So um, for now, we, are tar we usually target the ergosterols. They're always looking for other more distinguishable targets in order to avoid toxicity to human cells. Um, this is figure 525, a multicellular fungi. A uh, multicellular fungi is generally called, its common name is, is some kind of mold, right? And they form hyphae, which can be septate or non-septate. So these are septate hyphae. See how they are? They're made up of kind of a chain of identical size and shape cells. And then this is a non-septate hyphae, so the cells have kind of just all merged together. And then pseudo-hyphae is where it's kind of, they have a little bit of both. And also, um, it's, it's almost like yeast cells are coming together and resembling a mold, but they are in fact yeast cells. This is a life cycle of a zogomycete. They have both, again, sexual and asexual life cycles. 
In the sexual life cycle, the positive and negative types conjugate to form a zygosporangium. Here is germination, mycelia form. You have the two types, the positive and negative, that are in close proximity, and then extensions called gametangia form between them, so it's kind of like a little mating structure forms, and they come into contact. And then plasmogamy, this is where the um, positive and negative mating types result. They come together, they fuse, and then you have what is called a zygosporangium with a multiple haploid nuclei, right? So it gets a nuclei from here, and the nucleus from here, and then it forms a big, thick, protective coat around that genetic information. And then you have karyogamy, where the nuclei fuse, and that is where your zygote comes from. And, and that at that point is where your nucleus is diploid. And then you have meiosis and germination, similar to what happens in humans, meiosis. Um, and then a sporangium grows on a little short stalk, and the haploid spores are formed inside. And then the spores are then released in order to go and colonize a different area. Figure 531 is showing the ascomycete life cycle. And um, I just have a suggestion. When you're looking at these life cycles for fungi, it would be really beneficial if you could see the similarities and the differences. For example, the ascomycete life cycle does include a stage of meiosis, which is similar to that of the zygomycete life cycle. Okay, um, and there, but there are some different differences as well. Ascomycete life cycle is named for these uh, structures that they form called an ascus. So in this one, the ascogonium and the antheridium fuse. Some of these terms are very similar to plant biology terms, so they're kind of difficult. It's really funny the way that they taxonomy takes great pains to differentiate fungi from plants, and yet sporangium and and theridium, and they have all of these terms that are, are similar to plant biology terms. But try not to get hung up too much in all of this jargon, because it's going to be a lot to remember. Just try to remember the things that make them unique, and the things that make them similar, like that they form a zygote that's diploid, right? So they, they undergo karyogamy, uh, and then they have meiosis, and then germination, so dispersal via a spore. So that is common in um, ascomycetes as well as zygomycetes, right? Um, and then in the basidiomycetes, again, you have a step with the karyogamy here that forms a diploid nucleus and then it undergoes meiosis again. And then again, you also have germination and dispersal via spores. So this is very, very similar. The thing that really kind of makes this different from the other ones, the, basidio, the basidiomyces, is it has this prolonged stage in the middle in which it has what is known as a dicarion that is present in the nucleus. So that's the step here. And then we have over here a basidium with four nuclei, but they're all uh, haploid nucleus. So that, that's, that's a couple things that make Basidiomycete uh, different from the other ones, even though they all look very similar, right? So Basidiomycetes, it looks very, very similar to the Zygomycetes, but it does have this dicarion step. Um, okay, let's move on to algae. Algae are photosynthetic eukaryotic protists. They, again, can be unicellular or multicellular. And again, the larger ones, the large multicellular ones, they look very much like tissues, or like plant tissues, but they are not. These are going to be, the, the really large algae are actually seaweeds. Seaweed are not plants. They are not plants. They don't have any kind of organs like plants do. Algae most of the time are not pathogenic, but they can form uh, toxic algal blooms. So they can become indirectly toxic to humans because they contaminate seafood. And if you eat seafood that has eaten these toxic algal blooms, that can actually cause you to become paralyzed. Algae are important for making agar. So the stuff that we put into the media in the lab in our agar plates that actually is derived from uh, seaweed, also you know algae, same thing, um, except for 
well, size. Seaweed is just a really large algae. And then, um, yeah, we get the extract from that is where we get the agar that solidifies our uh, media plates and deeps and slants, right? So here, this is a nice figure, uh, figure 536. It's got a really large, diverse group of different types of uh, algae. So A here, this is kelp. Right? So this is an example of an algae that really, really looks like a plant, but it is not a plant. It's an algae. It's a, a protist, a eukaryotic protist. Um, this is some red algae. It's also multicellular. C here is showing the green algae, Halomidae incrassati, incrassata, which grows on the seafloor in shallow water. And again, it looks looks like a plant, but it's not. It's actually a protist. Um, D, this is an example of bioluminescent protist. Uh, so you see that stuff glowing right there? This, these are uh, dinoflagellates that are bioluminescent. Um, e is, um, these are diatoms. You may have seen some diatoms in the lab too when we were looking at pond, pond water. They call them the diamonds of the sea and they make up dichotomous earth. Um, and then these are volvox. You also may have seen some of these in the pond water. Volvox make up these uh, colonies. So they're little cooperative colonies of diff they're all different um, organisms but they live together and they kind of form this really large colony that looks can look to the untrained eye as one big organism but it's actually an association of several algae or algae that have formed a colony lichens are actually symbionts they're an example of symbiosis between either a fungi or an algae that are living together or a fungi and cyan cyanobacteria that are living together. It's not really a true symbiosis though. In it's They call it a controlled parasitism. So the fungus is definitely benefiting. Um, the algae or the cyanobacterium that's associated with the fungus can either be not receiving benefit or harm or sometimes they actually are being harmed. So it, it's kind of a slippery slope. It's not a true symbiosis where both things are being benefited. The fungus definitely is. Sometimes the algae is. Sometimes the cyanobacterium is. But more often than not, the fungus is benefiting and the other organism is actually being harmed. Lichens grow very slowly and they can live for a very long time. They can live for centuries and they can live in lots of different kinds of environments. They are environmentally important. They help to create the soil, right? They're really important in the, uh, the life cycle and the food chain. They provide a lot of food for other organisms and animals, and they can act as indicators of air pollution. And because they live so long, you can look at its stages of growth. If you look at a cross section of lichen, you can actually see, just like rings on a tree, you know, what year was a good year as far as air pollution and yeah so it makes it a very good biological indicator for people looking at environmental impact studies and things like that. Uh, this is figure 538 a cross-section of a lichen thallus and it's showing the, this cortex up here is the fungal hyphae and it's um, providing protection it's it's kind of it's structurally it's it's stronger than, than the other parts you have the algal zone so up here is the fungi here is the algae and then um, again the medulla has fungal hyphae and then you have another co cortex the lower cortex which again is fungal and provides structural support and protection and then the rhizines down here are anchors so these are kind of the where it attaches to a substrate so there's there's this is an example of a fungal algal uh, symbiosis here are some more examples of lichens so this one here in uh, figure 539a this is a crustose lichen that's found in marine rocks um, and here is a foliose lichen so that's more in um, humid environments and, and forests tropical forests things like that and then a fruticose lichen uh, over here in C this is pretty poisonous it was once used to make arrowheads so these these were actually used in war uh, okay so chapter six goes into viruses and it is an entire chapter just on viruses because 
viruses can be kind of a, a different topic. It's, it's more difficult to talk about viruses than it is to talk in general about prokaryotes and eukaryotes because they're a little tricky. In fact, there, there's a whole school of thought, thought that says that viruses aren't even actually living things because they don't, they don't live without a host and they can't reproduce on their own. And they're, they're just unique. So all of chapter 6 talks about viruses. Uh, viruses are ultra-microscopic, which is a fancy word for very, very, very small. Viruses are measured in nanometers. So we're familiar with millimeters, centimeters, micrometers. Viruses are measured in nanometers. Very, very small. Virions are acellular. They consist of either DNA or RNA, but never both. See, humans, we have both. Viruses and variants do not. Um, and they're surrounded by a protein, capsid. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites that infect cells found in plants, animal, fungi, protists, bacteria, archaea. So they're really not specific to... Um, well, certain viruses are specific to certain hosts, but as far as viruses as a whole, they can infect pretty much anything else in the tree of life. But they cannot live without a host. They have to have a host. They have to be able to infect another cell in order to reproduce. They do have limited host ranges, and specific viruses will infect specific species. Um, and specific cell types. And they do have these different types of shapes. They're categorized and identified by the shapes of their capsids. They're helical, polyhedral, or complex. And this is how they are classified based on their shape, their morphology, right? The type of nucleic acid they have, whether they have DNA or if they have RNA. And then, of course, the kinds of hosts that they infect. And then what types of enzymes. Because they do, they don't have a lot. Like they don't have these intercellular structures and membrane brown nuclei and all these kind of things. But some of them do have different types of enzymes, and some of them are motile. And so they have some characteristics of living things, but then they lack they lack several other characteristics of living things. They're kind of an enigma, really. Figure six four is uh, showing. It's comparing the sizes of different things in relation to a virus just to kind of illustrate how small a virus actually is. So over here on the 0.1 nanometers would be the size of a single atom and then it goes all the way up to one millimeter which is the size of a frog's egg and, and right here is a human egg so if you can picture like a, a, a grain of pollen or a human egg, right? And then smaller than that are animal and plant cells. Even smaller than that are red blood cells. Even smaller than that are your prokaryotic cells. And then right around here is where your viruses fall out. So we're talking 10 nanometers on up to about 200 nanometers. And then the next smallest thing is like an individual protein. Very small. So this is uh, figure 6.3, which is further illustrating just how small. This is an electron micrograph of a virus. It shows how small a virus is compared to a bacterial cell. This is a, a virus that is infecting. It's in the process of attaching and infecting a bacterial cell. And that is known as a bacterial phage when a virus infects a bacterial cell. And just look, look how tiny it is compared to the bacterial cell. This over here, part B of the figure, is showing the structure of this particular virus. They do not all look like this, but, um, but it is showing the capsid with the genome, the viral uh, molecular information, genetic information. And then it's just got some structures here that are basically made up of protein. And that's it. No other organelles, right? Um, these are some viral capsids that are of varying shapes. So here's your helical. These are all micrographs, electron microscope images. This is helical shaped capsid. These ones are polyhedral or tetrahedral. And then of course these guys are complex shaped. So they've kind of got a lot of 
substructural elements going on here. But if that is all the capsid and then it's got the genetic information inside of it, either DNA or RNA. But remember, the viruses don't have both. They have one or the other. Um, the life cycle is essentially the stages of infection of a virus. Because remember, they don't have a life cycle on their own. They only reproduce by infecting a host cell. And then the host cell is actually responsible for creating more virus. It's kind of twisted that way. but So the life cycle of a virus is the stages of infection for the virus. So that is a penetration, then uncoating of the capsid, and then biosynthesis by the host cell cells. So it infects the cell, the cells divide. And as the cells divide, it's not only replicating, you know, the host is not only replicating its own genetic information, it also then replicates the virus's genetic information. And then, of course, there's maturation and release. So once the virus has taken over the host cells, the host cell will actually lyse and then release more and more viruses out to infect other cells. A bacteriophage, those are the viruses that infect bacterial cells, right? Those can have either a lytic or a lysogenic cycle. The lytic cycle ends up killing the host, which seems kind of counterintuitive. You wouldn't, why would you want the host to die if the host is biosynthesizing? But um, that's why we also have the lysogenic cycle, and this leads to uh, integration of the viral genetic information into the host's genome. So it's kind of sabotaging the host's DNA. Bacterial phages actually inject the DNA into the host cell, while animal viruses, they enter by endocytosis, endocytosis or membrane fusion. So the cells are bringing the virus in. It's, it's different. Uh, in bacterial phages, the, the virus attaches to the bacterial cells, and it injects the DNA like it was in a syringe, kind of. It, it injects its DNA into the bacterial cell. Whereas animal viruses, the host cells actually bring the virus inside, the whole virus inside of the host cell. And then most plant viruses, there are positive strand, single-stranded stra single RNA. They can either be latent in the host cells or they can become like a chronic infection or they can become lytic, which in which case they kill the host cells. Animal viruses can become latent and asymptomatic or they can actually and or they can integrate into the host cells uh, DNA that they can similar to lysogeny. And then the growth curve of bacteriophages is really different from the growth curve of um, pathogens or bacteria. Bacteria will have that sigmoidal growth curve with the lag phase and the log phase and the stationary phase and the death phase, remember? Viruses don't grow that way. It's a one-step multiplication. And, and they will just go and grow and grow and multiply and multiply and multiply until either their host is killed or until their DNA has integrated with the host's DNA. And then it will then it will have to take on the growth curve of its host. Bacterial phages can also transfer information between hosts using uh, transduction. So I'm going to show you some figures. This is figure six, seven, and this is showing the lytic cycle. So in the lytic cycle, the phage replicates and then destroys the host cell. So this is the attachment phase, right? And then penetration where the DNA is injected into the bacterial cell. And then you have biosynthesis where the host is replicating the viral DNA. Um, and then maturation. So we have new viruses that have been assembled. And then lysis, this is where the host cell is actually being killed. The new viruses ex are expelled so that they can infect new cells. This is uh, an example of a bacteriophage that has both lytic and lysogenic cycles. So here again, we have the attachment and then the virus injects its DNA. Then this is a lysogenic property where the DNA becomes incorporated into the host cell. Then that cell divides and then the viral DNA is being replicated with the host DNA. There are certain conditions where the viral DNA can be excised from the bacterial DNA. And then if that happens, 
or when that happens, then it becomes a lytic cycle. So then it shifts from a lysogenic life cycle to a lytic cycle, in which case your viral DNA will be assembled and then the new phage particles will end up lysing and killing the host cell. This is influenza. Um, so here are the steps again, right? Attachment, penetration. Now you see how this virus is not injecting the DNA, right? because this is an animal virus. So it is actually coming into the animal cell via endocytosis. Uh, but it does, in fact, penetrate the cell. Then it uncoats, so the capsid breaks away and all of the contents are released into the host cell. And then there's biosynthesis that occurs within the host cell. New viruses are assembled and then they are released not only out into the host cell but out of the host cell so that they can go and infect new cells. This cell does become overtaken by newly assembled phages then eventually that cell will lice. So viral cultivation is much different from bacterial cultivation because viruses need host cells and to survive so you can actually culture in a lab viral cells by using whole organisms or embryos or doing cell cultures where you grow out cells and then you infect the cells with viruses and it is kind of tricky because you have to keep them infected enough to propagate the virus but not so infected that it kills all of your cells right um, and then you can isolate the viruses from the cells once they've grown out by filtration um, and then you can detect and count and determine how much virus you have um, by growing out a bacterial lawn and then putting measured kind of similar to a serial dilution like we did when we were counting bacterial cells you put out measured amounts of the virus and let it incubate and then see how many plaques you have. The plaques determine how many cells were infected and then lysed. Um, animal and plant viruses, they're a little bit more difficult to detect and to, to quantify than bacterial viruses, right? Um, but you can using cytopathic effects, different molecular techniques, um, immunoassays, and then serological assays. So uh, figure 619 is showing uh, cell culture. So these are lung tissues that, oh, sorry. Uh, what they do is they grow them out in a lab and then they do um, a controlled infection, right? And then you can actually observe the lung cells to see if they have transformed or if they're, for, if they're forming tumors and the like. And then this is showing um, how you can count viruses using the plaque assay, right? So you've grown bacteria out on the lawn, and then you can actually see how many um, plaques are formed, indicating that bacterial cells that are lysed. So again, you can see how it's very similar to doing like a serial dilution for bacteria and you kind of have a countable plate. It's very similar to that, except instead of counting the bacteria, you're counting sort of the absence of bacteria. Um, and then this is an example of how you would uh, quantify um, animal or plant viruses, where you're using membrane filters to remove uh, the virus from the solution. So um, the size of the pores and the filters can determine what is captured on the surface of the filter. Um, this is an example of an immunoassay. Um, we don't have to go too, too far into this, except for um, it's basically you're using antibodies and enzymes in order to um, remove the conjugate and then um, you end up with this substrate enzyme interaction and there is a color change that you can observe in order to see if the virus is present and how much of the virus is present. That is a really kind of dumbed down version of an immunoassay. But we're not going to go into great detail about how, because we're not doing those in the lab. Suffice it to say that uh, antibody uh, immunoassays, they're really neat because they can scan for things very quickly. Essentially, if the, um, if the agent that you're looking for is present, then it will attach to the appropriate substrate. 
uh, via the enzyme, and you can have a visible observation, a visible color change that you can see if something is present, or if it is not present, then you won't you won't see it because it will uh, the enzyme will get washed away. Uh, so let's finally we'll move on to 6.4 viroids, virosoids, and prions. Um, viroids are very small. I mean, even smaller than viruses, and they are naked, single-stranded in RNAs. In other words, they don't have a capsid, um, and these cause diseases in plants. Virusoids are single-stranded RNAs that um, they require helper viruses in order to cause infection. So they actually need other viruses that they kind of piggyback onto in order to cause infection. Um, and, and think of it this way, when it says cause infection, Really what it means is that it, it needs not only host cells, but it needs another virus to help it enter a host cell in order for it to replicate its genetic material. And then prions, they're proteinaceous infectious particles that cause a disease called spongiform encephalopathies. Um, it, prions are really kind of a freak of nature because they have no genetic information and they're extremely resistant to chemicals and heat, tr treatment via radiation. There, there is no known, currently no known treatment for a prion infection. These are really kind of scary. Um, figure 6.24 shows uh, potatoes that have been infected by potato spindle tuber, tuber viroid. Um, this is spread when infected knives are used to cut healthy potatoes, and then those potatoes are planted. So this just shows that there's like mutation involved in these potatoes, and that has to do with the fact that their, their DNA has been infiltrated by a viroid DNA. Um, and then this is a brain scan, a normal brain over here on the left, versus brain tissue of a patient that has the uh, spongiform cephalopathy, right, a prion infection. And you can see normal brain tissue here, and then brain tissue lesions. They, they call it spongiform because it looks like holes in a sponge. This concludes the material that we will cover for Lesson 5. I want to thank you guys, as usual, for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.